Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, before we begin the proceedings, I would like to acknowledge and pay respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. It is upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built. As we share our knowledge, teaching, learning and research practices within the university, may we also pay respect to the knowledge embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of country. So thank you. Welcome to Rare Brews in Conversation. My name is Matthew Davis. Um, I'm an associate director with the library, but on the side I'm also an enthusiastic home brewer. It was with much pleasure that I welcome today our wonderful guest, Topher Bohm of Wildflower Brewing and Blending. Thank you. Texan by birth, Topher joins us today as a Sydney University alumni, graduating in physics and the history and philosophy of science. It was during university that Topher first started brewing, putting into practice the scientific processes by which he learned to refine the art of brewing for precision and consistency in production. He has been working in commercial breweries since 2013, firstly at Flat Rock Brew Cafe and Batch Brewing Company. Topher began to explore native yeast in 2014, which sparked a new period of learning and discovery and experimentation which saw him travelling to northern France and Belgium in 2015, where he turned at Brasserie Thierry, and later he travelled to Partizan Brewing in London and Jester King in Texas. In March 2017, Topher, with his brother-in-law and business partner Chris, opened Wildflower Brewing and Blending in Barrackville. So thank you for coming today, Topher. No worries, thank you. I have to say, just quickly before we start, this feels like really, really um, high tech when we're talking about something that's so low tech like all yeah. world brewing you know all the speakers and things like that so anyway but no thanks for having me yeah so I'd just like to start off um, now you describe your brewery specializing in farmhouse ales uh, would you be able to describe what a farmhouse ale is <laughs> sure and um, what it is yeah. that makes wildflower yeah. unique yeah um, we were talking about this before I, I generally uh, farmhouse ales or farmhouse beers are sort of subcategory of, of the of the beer sort of uh, world, you might have lagers and, and, and English ale brewing. Farmhouse sales, generally, um, just as an explanation, are this category of beers that's a little loose, it's a little rustic. Um, they're beers that are brewed um, for purpose rather than for precision. Um, however, uh, I don't call my brewery a farmhouse brewery um, because uh, people sort of associate that with the beers that we do brew, but um, I'm squarely focused in the uh, directly the flight path of Merrickville. Um, there are no cows uh, surrounding me. I don't grow any of my own barley, unfortunately. Um, I certainly don't grow my hops. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and there are people that are doing that. There are people that are out there now um, doing modern day representations of some of the beer practices that we're talking about. Um, whole holistically, you know, my focus uh, in terms of the exhibit and, and what we're talking about today is probably more on the yeast perspective uh, because of my use of natural or more wild indigenous yeast in our beer. Um, but there are also people out there who are growing their own barley, malting it, growing their own hops. Um, there's an estate ale being made in Tasmania right now uh, by a brewery called Van Diemen. Um, he hasn't released it yet because these beers age for a very, very long time. But um, I feel like calling myself a farmhouse brewery or farmhouse kind of isn't right when there's people that are taking you know that are truly farmers as well so um, I don't really call it that I think I just call them like yeast driven <laughs> Franco-Belgian old world ales that's a little bit longer it's a bit of a mouthful but um Fantastic. yeah so that's that's farmers brewing and yeah okay well we'll talk a little bit more about yeast in a moment mm -hmm. but um, so you um, you've talked before that your focus on brewing has shifted away from wort creation, which is where a lot of brewing is at the moment, um, to yeast as the main star of your brewery. So can you talk a little bit about the yeast you use, how you came about them, um, and how they feature in the flavour profile of your beers? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll just start by separating the sort of process of brewing. Um, Word production is people is the process that people generally might associate with brewing. It's where you're you're mashing, you're, you're converting um, sugars from from malted barley into a sort of liquid, um, dextrinous, sugary wort. That then wort is unfermented beer, W O R T, uh, and then you boil it and you add your hops. It's it's great for photos because there's steam in people's faces and it's really marketing sexy. But it takes about eight hours uh, to brew a good a good um, batch of beer. 
Um, and that, that's, work, that's the work production. When you finish that day, Matthew was just doing a brewing exhibition upstairs. Um, when you finish that, uh, you've only sort of just started the first part of the whole brewing process. So after you make work, you need to ferment it uh, with yeast. And so right, what we do, uh, what we've done at Wildflower, is separate those two aspects. Traditional breweries and majority of breweries um, would have a brew house where they make their work, and then they also have their fermentation cellar where they conduct the different fermentations. We, on the other hand, only have a fermentation cellar. In Marrickville, there's a number of breweries just surrounding us, so we sort of share the resources and their capabilities and just buy time on their brew houses for them to produce it. The other part, there's a few reasons why we do that. One is financially, it wouldn't have worked to age our beer for as long as we do, as well as purchase the brew house. Um, but, but also, it keeps me not focused on work production, and this is what um, we're talking about. Basically, I focus entirely on fermentation, so by the time that, that work gets to me, it's already been brewed, I don't have to worry about cleaning the tanks or what's happened there. They're my recipes that they brew for me, um, but uh, that way when it comes to me, my focus is directly on fermentations, which is where I think the majority of the flavor in beer comes from. The reason, oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So right. maybe, maybe if you want to talk a bit about um, your yeast, yeah. which yeah, I believe yeah. is quite unique. And Special. Yeah, so I think specifically, I think for the for the um, talk today, we uh, tra I travel to these different breweries and learn these old world traditions of being able or techniques of utilizing yeast that's naturally occurring, um, yeast that's captured or harvested or um, foraged. It's a very sexy marketing word in the in the food world. Forage from the wild and use them to ferment the beer. So. Um, our house, our house culture is not a monoculture. Um, it's a mixed culture. There's different strains of yeast. There's different types of organisms that are at work there. There's Saccharomyces. There's Brettanomyces. There's Lactobacillus, which is a lactic acid-producing bacteria you find in sourdough and, and yogurt. Um, all of these things work together to create a really diverse, interesting flavor. Um, converse. I mean, you can you can sort of pinpoint that against um, traditional brewing or what. Uh, most people do now. I, traditional as of 1890. I mean, the, the, I don't know if Emil Christian Sansen books is, is, is on display out there, but um, <coughs> the first monoculture fermentation was uh, in the 1890s at the Carlsberg Brewery. So when I say traditional uh, being monoculture is really only 130 years. Um, most beer being made is, is a monoculture fermentation. So it's a single strain of, um, of yeast, of a Saccharomyces strain. There might be millions and billions and trillions of these, of these uh, yeasts, but this one strain works uh, solely to do the fermentations. Those beers are um, consistent, they're predictable, um, and they generally have these sort of clean um, characteristics. Like you mentioned at the, in the um, introduction, I just fell in love with the, 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 the nuance of um, mixed culture fermentation. I fell in love with the um, sense of place that you can get from brewing with yeast that's actually harvested from the area that you're brewing in. People talk about local things and, and local um, food and all of these kinds of things. And, and in beer, um, we can basically order yeast from a yeast lab in, in France or in, or in America and have it sent out and make that beer. I could make the exact same beer if I was back home in Texas, um, basically, that I could here with the access to ingredients that we have, and it just didn't seem right for me to move halfway across the world, start my industry and my craft, and be able to do the exact same thing in the place where I grew up. So that's where we focus on it. I mean, <coughs> Matt's had the beers. It creates hugely different variations Definitely. of flavor, um, but also it, it just it means something else uh, as well. Your yeast is specifically cultivated from the New South Wales region, is that right? Yeah, so well, the, the wild yeast aspect to it. So we, we have, a, in the mixed culture, there is um, an, a, a strain that originates from Belgium. Um, we've had it in our brewery for a while, but um, all of the wild yeast, so the, there's basically one strain of this Belgian culture and everything else is from New South Wales, yeah. So I cultivated yeast off of sugar sources found in the wild, so yeast need sugar to survive, um, so anywhere you uh, have sugar in the wild, you will probably also find yeast. And so we cultivate it off of fruit, off of flowers, and then from traditional spontaneous fermentations by leaving uh, unfermented beer out, exposed to the overnight air, and allowing things to fall in, and that to start the fermentation. 
So um, we cultivated all these things and then just tested with them. It general, generally, not, not always does it create a, a good um, capture, a good beer, uh, but sometimes it does, and that's when it's fun to, fun to use. Um, looking through some of the books before, when I came in a, uh, sort of a month ago, I guess, um, there were these sort of really vague descriptions as to how to collect yeast, like where to get a yeast cake from, and it's very, very vague. Um, and so, it, you know, it's pretty, before any Christian hands, 130 years ago, um, you can imagine people would have had to cultivate yeast yeah. from somewhere, and, and so, I don't know, maybe they got it from a baker, or they got it from a friend who's a brewer down the road, but they had to start using it somehow. And I think a lot of the recipes talk about making yeast cake from flour and water that mm -hmm. they've had left out overnight on a windowsill or somewhere just to, till it starts to bubble. Yeah. And then you would add that to your wort to start the fermentation. Yeah, which, I mean, th there are beers being made around the world, very small batches um, of you know, sort of collaborations between brewers and, and, and sourdough bakers where people take the sourdough cool. culture and pitch it into their beer, their wort rather, it's not fermented. Um, and it will make a beer. I mean, it's, it's interesting, it's fascinating. Our exhibition is a story of brewing as it transformed from, transformed from a domestic act activity into a sort of scientifically controlled large-scale industry. In some ways you've taken the opposite journey. Um, can you describe how the change in direction came about and what does this mean in terms of your approach to brewing, like the philosophy and the practice? Yeah, um, there's a lot tied up in that uh, question <laughs> to be honest. Um, <coughs> Firstly, I mean, I, I never brewed on a very, very large scale. Um, you know, even, uh, but Batch might be known around Marrickville, but um, it's not a national brand uh, by any means. Um, but uh, certainly an analytical approach uh, that, then, that then changed. Um, I, I've actually thought about this before, because I've just from my own perspective, I think one of the things that, one of the reasons that I switched was um, it was not. So this uh, monoculture brewing wasn't very interesting to me anymore. Um, when you're putting the same inputs in and you're getting the same beer every single time, you've successfully created beer and you've successfully um, replicated that over and over and over again. And at some stage, uh, for me, I'm really fidgety um, and I, I didn't want that anymore. I wanted there to be a certain amount of unpredictability. Um, as well as the fact that I've always had, I mean, I studied physics, but I took the least amount of math classes that I could and did history and philosophy of science and then some, some arts classes as well um, because I mean I just sort of like th I throw clay or throw for pottery um, things I've always had this sort of other side to me outside of the analytical point and this style of brewing this sort of old world um, Franco-Belgian or working with wild yeast um, approach allowed for both of those things to happen in harmony so still there's a there's an analytical scientific approach to how I have to work with mixed culture yeast. I mean, it's not all shooting from the hip. Um, but then also there is a point where you have to give the yeast your work and you just have to trust it. And you have to work with Brother Measure instead of mastering it. There's this, there's a great um, Belgian producer um, called Kenzion and, and Jean Bonnois is the producer there, the, the brewer, and he, um, he, he'll he always correct someone if they call him a brewmaster. And he's like, no. No one masters this. Like what he does is his lambics with spontaneous fermentation. You you enter into a partnership with nature. You're not engineering or domineering her at all. And that was yeah, I like that. Some of the the recipes in the uh, exhibition and competition go back as far as the 18th century. Mm -hmm. And one thing we discovered when we were trying to convert these into uh, modern brewing recipes was the surprising lack of detail on the types of ingredients. Uh, malt was malt, yeast was yeast, and hops were hops. That's, that's all the description you got. Um, we know that certain malts can possibly have been used. Um, for, exa for example, um, brown malt was heavily used back then, but we know that it has low diastatic <coughs> power, which is the ability for the enzymes to convert it, the starches into sugar. So it must have used uh, another type of power malt in there as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so there must have been local knowledge that was commonplace, but felt so unnecessary that it wasn't needed to be written down. Um, you mentioned on your website that much of your time in northern France and Belgium and Wallonia was spent learning the old ways and the forgotten techniques um, from before pure yeast strains and, and monoculture. So how much of the, of the brewing you learnt was an oral tradition only? And what were the more interesting things that you discovered that really surprised you in that techniques? Yeah, no, um, just I'll get to that 
just to unpack that a little yeah. bit and, and explain that, that um, you know, to a lot of us, malt is malt and hops are hops and yeast well, and water is water. Um, but there's specifically with the, the sort of boom of the craft beer industry, um, different varietals of barley or different varietals of hops have become um, more famous for their flavors uh, than others. And, and so you basically have a branding of, um, well, it's not basically, it is a branding um, of these uh, certain, you know, US Cascade versus Australian Cascade. Um, and so there's this uh, disconnect now um, between you know being able to uh, precisely shop for um, hop harvest and you know varietal uh, yeah. than, than than used to be, and th this is different than um, than, a, than a great varietal uh, variation. Um, these are uh, you know mosaic and centennial are, are closer than um, Tempranillo and Shiraz, just as a just as a um, explanation. Um, the uh, the part um, we were asking about the oral, oral tradition. Um, it was funny. I was just saying before we came in. I feel like a bit of a farce because you know I've started brewing 2013 commercially. This hasn't been that long of a of a journey for me, and I hope to continue this for a lot longer. Um, but uh, I'm in, by no means an expert, and the reason I don't feel like an expert is because a lot of the things that I have learned aren't written down in you know beautiful books. And I don't know why we have this association with oral tradition or oral. Uh, knowledge not being um, as valid, I guess, as something that's gone through the scientific process or something, I don't know, or written down by someone that we trust. Um, but yeah, a lot of it was. Um, a lot of times, um, you know, having one day with um, um, a producer like uh, like a Brasier de Bourgie, which is another one very, very close to, to, to Thierry, and talking to them just for a few hours about how they manage their yeast and their fermentation um, was probably some that that you know is 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 a more than a books more than two books worth of information that you can sort of yeah. deconstruct and decompact and ask questions about either way. So um, the the types of information that I pulled out of those specifically the oral traditions um, or the sort of just continuation or of practice um, in, in in France was was mostly um, about yeast health. Um, and um, uh, handling of yeast, the, the, the French don't, um, the French and Belgians don't, well the ones that I was working with, didn't handle their yeast so sterilely as, as we would in a, in a large lager or production brewery. That's not to say that they were unclean, it's just that they really saw their yeast as a living product rather than just a base ingredient that they put in. Um, so was a, there was a frame, for like a mind uh, set difference as well as um, a sort of practicing difference. Uh, along from that in, in France and Belgium um, was uh, an approach that was different. These people were producing, and this is sort of less tactile than the ingredients, but they, 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 they were brewing because that was their job. Um, and then they went home and they took after, they looked after their family and um, they'd been doing this for, you know, for generations in the family. It wasn't this, um, you know, Instagram marketing, uh, craft beer sort of thing that we have now. It was just what they did. It's just a trade. It was just a yeah. trade. Um, and that was probably more influential, talking about that and understanding brewing as a, as a process that, you know, fed the community or, you know, if, you know not, we're, we're fed in a way, I guess, as well, with uh, nutrition and barley. But, um, uh, yeah, it's something that they provided just as much as the person down the road um, running the pharmacy provided the community and that, that was really, really interesting. Um, in, in Texas, uh, back at Jester King, sorry to take this really long, but um, the uh, oral traditions there were, were, were practice. I mean, these it, it's, it's a new brewery, which Jester King was only 20, um, 2009, I think, or something like that they started. And they've been experimenting with things that they've been told and trying to create best practice with a modern viewpoint on old world techniques. The Gesture King also ferments with mixed culture fermentations. And so it was both of us just kind of looking at each other and work with these brewers going, why do you do that? And they said, I, I don't know, it just works, <laughs> you know? And okay, well, let's do that then for a while. Or me questioning them and saying, you know, wh why, why did you do this? Like, oh, someone told us to do it this way. And then, you know, s some producer from Belgium told them that. And so there's been a, there's a lot of, the, 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 the community of people that, that practice these types of fermentations is pretty small. Um, we all talk, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's quite interesting to hear some of those things that you talk about because whenever we read these recipes there were all these sort of practices that you can't understand quite why they did it. Um, but obviously it had some effect 
either for preserving the wort before it went to, mm. before it was boiled. Um, so for example, we have some recipes where people um, recommended boiling uh, hops in the water that you then plan to mash with. Mash mm. with. Um, you had people who added ginger to the mash, which obviously it must have had some sort of preservative. Yeah. Um, so these are things that we're not quite sure why they why they happen. It probably just worked. <laughs> the, the, the same with the uh, the old uh, before we we understood yeast. Yeah. Um, so you use the same brew paddle to um, to to stir your. Yeah. The Scandinavian countries have these yeah. beautiful um, sort of lattice like wooden um, necklaces. Almost they look they would drop into beer fermenting beer and, and, and then drop into the next one. Yeah, yeah so amazing Fantastic. stuff like that, yeah. I just want to talk a little bit about the role of women in brewing. Mm -hmm. And I understand the irony of two, two men sitting here talking about the role of women. Yeah. But before the end of the 19th century, when brewing, before brewing embraced the scientific process, um, it was largely seen as a sort of a domestic activity. So women's work in the same way that producing food for the house um, was a domestic activity. Um, and women often supplemented their household income by selling surplus beer. Now, gradually, as brewing became more commercialised, the role of women in brewing diminished. In a similar way, uh, beginner beer was beginning to be seen as man's work and also as a man's drink. Now, with the craft beer industry, um, we are seeing a considerable rise in the number of women who make up the market share for, for beer in Australia and around the world. And I was wondering what your observations were on this and how wildflower brewing fits in. Sure. Um, yeah, and women aren't only making up the market share, they're making up the, the employment side as well. I mean, we're um, very lucky as an industry to, to, to be attracting really great talent um, that also have new women. Anyway, um, they, uh, it's interesting, and I think that that, that approach I was talking about that we learned in, in that I was learning about in Belgium, looking at this, this is a, as a trade or as something that you do just because it's, um, it is what it is. Uh, I think that, that that approach is probably what uh, influenced me most in um, in understanding beer as well. As something we'll talk about a little bit later, I'm sure, as, as a preservation technique. And so it did make me think about this industrialization, taking these practices out of homes and into factories and taking them away from, well, splitting up the genders uh, in terms of who's doing them. And then, um, and then you know, as, as we continue, uh, this is something I was thinking about when we were starting a brewery. I mean, as you, if you look at um, the growth or the sort of development of beer marketing, um, specifically from basically the, the 30s and 40s onward, um, it was so heavily made to be such a, such a, a man's drink. Um, it's really, really funny because it's not, that's not what uh, beer is, and I don't think that beer needs to be something that's that's only allowed for one, is only enjoyed by one by one uh, half of the population. Um, uh, along with that, uh, so along comes craft beer, and um, some of the some of those breweries and and some of the beer that has been being made is is far more gender neutral. Um, not only in the marketing, uh, there's some pretty horrendous marketing out there as well. Um, but there is, you know, generally a, a better sense of marketing. Um, from from the beer side, but also uh, from from the brewery side, but also from the base products as well, being um, sort of more interesting flavors. And um, at at um, at Wildflower, one of the things that I saw happening in the craft beer industry that I, I think what we do, I guess, in order to take this into perspective, one of the things that I saw was um, there's a lot of beers uh, being made out there that are just really uh, over and aggressive. Um, think about like triply hopped IPAs or. Um, hugely boozy Russian Imperial Stouts. Um, I don't find those beers all that attractive. I don't like um, I don't like uh, eating food with them because they ruin my palate. And I mean, my wife pointed out to me first. She said, "Like I'll never get close to that. Like it's just so offensive. Yeah. Um, it's so aggressive. It's so overt." And so what we attempt to do at, at, at a library, and this is along with the wild yeast, is express a lot of flavor um, without it being uh, demonstrative. Um, and and so I think what we do is we attempt to, to, to make beer that, that is subtle and, and nuanced and has balance and, and has length, um, you know, because my wife's palate's a lot better than mine. And I actually generally, all of my friends who are women or my family are women, they have far better palates than, than I do. They, they, they search for more in a drink um, than, than a male. And, and I, I like to think about, um, I like to think about uh, someone tasting my beer and then 
um, but they find time to finish that glass or that bottle, uh, tasting something entirely different because the whole beer is developed. And I think that's what we're really after. I mean, I, you're, you're, you're right. It's so ironic for two men to be sitting here talking about this. And I, 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 you know, we do these tours at the brewery, and I talk about how this was a really important part to me um, in 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 making the beer that we do. Uh, this this idea of being um, it's just a bit more androgynous in terms of how we make the beer and how we do it. But um, but I've also know that it's it's it can be this kind of like mansplaining thing, even if uh, anyway, it's it's such a tough one. It's a tough one. It is. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say, my wife is my barometer for whether or not my beer is any good. Mm -hmm. um, she's come up with a whole new lexicon of descriptive words. So, um, good year and. Um, is one of hers. So <laughs> is it you get those in your mosaic pop? Uh, yeah, IPAs? it tastes a little bit rubbery. Tired, it's, yeah. it's good year. Yeah. Um, so one of the images we have in the exhibit, which we've got up there, is the Hogarth's Gin Lane and Beer Street from 1751. Uh, now these images strive to demonstrate the virtues of beer, a relatively low alcohol drink compared with that of gin, which was recently introduced to England after William of Orange occupied the British throne. Uh, so gin was cheap because it was made with low quality barley um, that was unfit for beer production uh, and therefore drunk in quantity by the poor, uh, leading to much angst over the drunkenness and health issues uh, occurring within that population. What has been your experience during your travels with the traditions around beer as a staple food item um, and the role it plays in the house? Yeah. Um, I'm, th I'm thinking yeah. Tor, about your um, table beer. Yeah, well, yeah absolutely. Um, so we make a beer at the brewery that we only serve there as well, which is 3% in alcohol. Um, so it's a very, very low alcohol beer, and um, it has, our attempt is to make it full flavored. So it's um, it's not, I wouldn't classify it as a mid-strength, even though that's where it falls in terms of alcohol level. Um, that, that beer comes from a tradition, which is something that I experienced mostly, again, back in France. Um, Brasserie Thierrye has a 2.9% table beer um, that every day during during lunch, when we were at the brewery, um, we would, uh, the boil would be going. Hour-long lunch in France, very, very important, um, cannot be missed. Uh, so we'd sit down and we'd drink, um, we'd drink the table beer during during the middle of the workday. And for some reason, it really struck me as like, this is crazy. Like, we're drinking during the day. Like, how it is? How? It, but but you go back to work and, and you you really don't. It's it's not. It's it's a, such a low alcohol content. You don't feel it. Maybe a three thirty mil bottle of, um, of a 2.9% beer might be half a standard drink, maybe. Yeah. Um, so uh, that was my experience with it, was, was, was not only there, but, um, but also uh, in Belgium there's a, there's a tradition of um, table beers um, being produced for like children at school and stuff like that. Um, and I fell in love with this idea of beer being um, a purpose drink rather than something that um, is only for, for you know, um, basically imbibing. Um, and uh, that's why we, we, we make the beer at, at, at the breweries to kind of bring that tradition a little bit to Australia. Um, specifically with these two things, I, I kind of, I, I saw these, at a, I was at a distillery in London, they show, I saw this the first time, um, it was called Sip Smith, I'm looking at that gin, yeah. and um, they, were, they were talking to me about it um, and how like, uh, you know, this was, this was all propaganda and things like that, um, which to a large extent it kind of was, but at the same, you know, the beer industry wants to be uh, this, this thing held on high regard, um, you know, so, so civilized as compared to Gin Street. Um, but at the same time, I, I kind of think about it now and think about, like, if, if, if people, if, if people were, were brewing beers um, for sustenance and, and for, you know, uh, beer as a food preservation technique rather than um, something just be imbibing versus gin, which, which isn't, um, and this is, I have a lot of friends who make gin, so I'm not going to um, go too far into this, but, but gin, it's so much higher in alcohol. I mean, there's, there, it doesn't have the, the nutrients. Yeah. Um, it's been distilled, so the, ferment, the byproducts of fermentation that are healthy for you, um, that you might have in beer or in primary fermented wine, aren't there. <coughs> Um, and so I think there's a shred of truth amongst all of this uh, propaganda. Um, but uh, yeah, the, 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 the table beer is interesting in how it's been um, responded to, at least in the market. Uh, when I tell the story and get a chance to explain this product as being um, you know, something that, that can be enjoyed and you can still drive and it's not going to taste like water, um, and, and where it comes from, people really, really appreciate it. Um, but when you just drop it off at a table and, and or you send it off to a bottle shop and someone buys it. It's it's quite funny. People think, oh no, I can't have a, 
3%. can't have a three percent beer, a three percent craft beer. No way! Like that, <laughs> there's got to be nothing in that. And it's, I brewed it today. Well, batch brewed it for me today. Um, and it, I think about it as well as being this really non-consumptive product as well. I and mean, we use literally half of the amount of malt that you would use that I would use in making another one of my beers, a six percent amber ale. Um, we use less hops. Um, so you can imagine if you only had a certain amount of barley to harvest every year, you can't just go buy some from an overseas bar, you know, grower or something like that. Um, you know, like the economy was localized. Uh, then you would want to get more length out of those ingredients, and so that's another reason why low alcohol beers um, make sense. And 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 I mean, lastly, we, we all maybe we don't know what the water. Well, yeah. obviously, <laughs> water water being not uh, totally safe to drink. Um, uh, even with a small amount of malt, a small amount of sugar, um, a three percent, uh, you know, table beer, a low alcohol beer will last uh, a lot longer um, than boiled water. So it's a more preserved water as well as uh, as well as some small preservation of, of barley. So there's a lot of use for these things, and I think I think specifically in Australia with um, you know uh, the, the the hot hot weather, our taxation methods here, uh, I think that they have a great place here. I, I'm actually really surprised I don't see more of them. Um, but anyway, it's mine. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. It's quite interesting that um, in Eastern Europe there's a lot of tradition around um, low alcohol uh, drinks like kvass, mm -hmm. which is made from sourdough and it's usually about 1%, yeah. um, which everybody drinks. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's on the street, there's yeah. no building a license to sell that. Um, so it, it's quite interesting to see where that uh, alcohol as a preserving agent and mm -hmm. also preventing illness from bad water mm -hmm. um, has a role in, in this. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so that's, that's my end of my question. So I was hoping to throw it open to the audience if anyone have any specific questions for Topher. Sure. Uh, in um, the Belgian tradition, In the Belgian tradition, um, in the, the lambic halls and the fermentation halls, um, they um, they allow other species to come in and um, and take part um, during fermentation. They generally refer to it as their ecosystem. So we're talking about spiders and mice and cats and and everything. Um, I thought you were talking about yeast species. I was like, <laughs> yeah, no. Well, well, apparently there are there are things going on outside the. the Mm -hmm. I saw a, a nice photo of you sitting on some really yeah. brand new kegs. I was yeah. just wondering, um, are you going to get away with that in Australia, or uh, are you letting it happen, or is that are you engineering that? Well, we don't have it. It's happening. Can I record this? Yeah. <laughs> no, shut off the mic. No. Um, that's interesting. I, I haven't heard as much about that. I mean, in terms of the, the larger sort of ecosystems, you hear about those ecosystems in cellars and in wine. You know, the mold that yeah. grows and things like that. I haven't heard about it as much in beer. Um, but uh, there is certainly uh, environmental influences from everywhere. Um, we, when we um, sorted the brewery, I sprayed the, all of the timber in the brewery um, with finished beer that I really liked to inoculate uh, my brewery with the yeast that I wanted it to have. So in a way that, that the, the, the brewery itself is, uh, like the physical building, is part of our, um, part of our uh, process as well. It's, a, it's, a, it's essential now to, to the flavor of the beer. Um, people that have been making uh, clean, you know, uh, well, Pilsner Arkell um, in, in um, the Czech Republic uh, used to open ferment their lager um, until about the 1990s. This is lager, this is a pure, mono, pure strain fermentation, but they did it so long in these halls um, that, that every tile, everything was so um, impregnated with that yeast that there was no risk of, it, of infection. Um, so it's not surprising that anyone talked about that. Um, you know, we, I mean, we, we're, we're, my wife's pregnant, she has to have a baby, baby in a few weeks. And um, we were learning, I, I was learning at some class or something like that about the sort of bacterial baptism that a child gets from, from you uh, as, as a parent. Um, when they're born, I mean, it's this your bacterial and ecosystem is integral for, for life of all kinds. So yeah, I mean, do I, uh, I've allowed it uh, in, and I encourage it in the sense of spraying down the walls. Um, the, the, the beer is made sanitarily uh, and it will not affect your health. Um, and the uh, health authorities do not need to come look at that yet. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> um, any other questions?
Yeah. Uh, reading some of the older recipes, mm -hmm. they seem to be really into adding eggs a lot. Um, I think the last recipe we saw had six eggs in the barrel for a year. Okay. Uh, have you heard of that being carried forward into modern brewing, or um, have we dropped the dairy? Maybe it's a fining agent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Would you? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that's what, that's what we believe, that it is yeah. the same way you would use um, well flocked tablets or Isinglass or Irish moss today, they use egg white. Yeah, so I mean, I can think of a few different things why you might do that. So fining being clarification, so uh, pulling out, like stripping out um, any, stripping, uh, flocculating any yeast or any other sediment that's sort of around in the beer to, to drop um, into the bottom so that when you rack off of that you have a clearer beer. However, I don't, I actually don't think that they would have been that worried about uh, the clarity of their beer at that stage. Um, I think there's probably also some, and this is an absolute shot on the torch, so if anyone is a yeast specialist, um, please tell me. There's, I reckon there's, there's probably some uh, yeast health um, things that you could Get from from um, from eggs, maybe some 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 sort of proteins that might help with haze formation or or head formation or um, yeast metabolism, maybe continuing a fermentation for longer, just a bit of extra um, different type of sugar. So I, I'm I'm not entirely sure. The first first idea would be on that. Um, as far as people continuing it, no, um, I've never done it, um, and uh, there's sort of uh, we use a um, icing glass, which Matt was talking about, which is a sort of or our Irish moss, ice and glass is different. We use Irish moss um, in the kettle, like literally moss, um, to uh, help pull out um, any sort of any uh, um, extra sort of proteins that are hazing, that are all floating around. So that's interesting. I wanted to look more at that. No, that's really six eggs in it. <laughs> it's all things that's pretty. I it, think it, breakfast beer that one. Yeah. <laughs> I think the stuff. shell's actually made out of calcium carbonate, so they'd use it as a a form of fighting against acidity. Yeah, for sure. Cool. And there's also, um, we know that certain minerals are important to yeast health. Yeah. Um, so that's why a lot of the recipes have raisins added to uh, the fermentation vessel because it's full of nitrogen and other types of minerals that the yeast feed on. Um, so My brother makes cider in the States and there's yeah. a traditional American cider with raisins added, which is not only for sugar and nutrients, but dried grapes. Yeast is on the skins yeah. of the grapes. So. Um, yeah, it could also be uh, another source of that, that yeah. yeast. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, have we got any other questions from the audience? Fantastic. Oh, we have Wait. one more? Yeah. Um, when you were searching for uh, various New South Wales yeasts, yeah. were you trying to get uh, any specific sources like uh, wattle or of anything representative of the state, or did you just go anything that starts fermenting when you're chucking the beer? I tendentially had a great harvest off of water blossoms. Um, so yeah, we absolutely did. In terms of flowers, um, uh, yeah, it was mostly um, uh, native flowers um, that we would go for. I didn't uh, cut any wildflowers from any um, you know national parks or anything like that. There was no sort of nefarious things going on there. Uh, but no, I mean, I was interested in, in, in using sort of more um, wildfires. So, well, I uh, see in the States we've got wildfires, we've got breweries named that. Um, native native <coughs> things. So, Grevelia was also really generous with yeast. Um, uh, sort of native dandelions, there's some areas I think that are, that are native. No, maybe not native. I don't know. There's some wild dandelions. Um, we're we're uh, very generous as well. Um, to be honest, I can't remember um, all the things. We were doing a lot of different. Um, batches. I'd have to go through all of my uh, sources of yeast, but um, and all my sort of documentation. But uh, there certainly were specific places that you would look for yeast, and specific places where you wouldn't. Um, also, different times of the year lend different uh, um, sort of uh, a diversity of, of cultures that you might collect. So, in the summertime, for example, you might get um, some more. Um, bad stuff, some more bad stuff, bacteria that, that doesn't taste great. Um, that goes dormant in the winter that you won't collect in the winter, which is primarily, in my opinion, why I think the water blossoms were so good. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think um, look, we, it, it took me about a year to, to get this culture going and to understand what it was, but I'm not preoccupied with maintaining it exactly the way that it is. We have to accept a certain amount of drift because 
the populations within the culture change themselves as well. Um, and so we'll, I haven't had a chance to do it this year, I've been really, really busy, but I'll continue to go out and search for things. So if anyone thinks there's an awesome source of yeast that they know of, um, please tell me and we'll, we'll capture some yeast off of it and see what happens. Yeah. Um, any more questions? All right, we might finish it off there. Did you, just before we finish, did you want to mention your collaborative beer? That you'll be sure, yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, in, in October, uh, well, a few months ago, we, we brewed a beer um, uh, with a, a monster from New South Wales and a hot brewer from um, sort of this far south coast, New South Wales. Um, and uh, we used our, our yeast and only our um, indigenous cultures, our, our native cultures, rather than uh, that, that Belgian saison strain that I was talking about wasn't a part of it. And so we've made a beer um, that, uh, is, as far as we know, is probably the first modern day representation of an entirely state driven um, beer. These uh, things only from um, this state. So uh, it's interesting, it's, it's sitting in a big 500 liter uh, punch in right now, barrel right now. Um, but I will release that yeah in October, so it's just going to go. It's 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 a fascinating project uh, in, in because it, it shows a lot of maturity in the in the um, industry to be able to support local monsters, hopsters, and, and people like me that are sort of crazy working with wild geese. But anyway, yeah, no, that, that's that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, well, thank you, Topher. Everyone, to give a round of applause. Thank you. And if you haven't already had a chance to have a look at the exhibition on Level 1 in the Rare Books Library, I encourage you to go down and have a look. Uh, there's some fantastic pieces down there, and those were just some images from uh, some of the books that are on display there. And I encourage any of you, who, if you're interested in brewing, to enter the homebrew competition, um, which closes on the 24th of September. Um, all the entries into Staves Brewery, we're asking people to brew recipes that we've pulled out from those rare books um, and put online. And th there's some great prizes in there. We've got um, Day as a Brewer at Staves and another brewery. We've got um, homebrew voucher packs. We've got merchandise packs. <coughs> Our brewery tours, it's fantastic. So um, if you're interested, get brewing. Thank you very much. Thank you.